Hi, I'm Suzanne Syracuse, and welcome to season two of my podcast, Focused on the Future, Keys to Building a Profitable, Sustainable, and Impactful Business. And I'm excited to be partnering with wealthmanagement.com on this. This series will focus on what firms need to embrace to ensure their growth and success for the future. And you'll hear from industry leaders and advisors on what is working for them. I have a great lineup of guests in store. And today I'm talking with Bryce Scaff. Bryce is co-head of the Global Client Group at Dimensional Fund Advisors, where he has been since 1998. The Global Client Group is a team of professionals committed to delivering an outstanding experience to advisors, intermediaries, and institutional investors around the world. Great firm. Well, welcome, Bryce. Thanks for being my guest. I'm really looking forward to speaking with you today. Thanks for having me, Suzanne. Awesome to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Great. Me too. So uh, I like to start off these podcasts asking everyone the same question, and I don't know the answer to yours at all. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. But more often than not, people get into this industry by accident. So tell us about your journey into a career within the wealth management industry and working with advisors. How did you end up at DFA? Yeah, I, lo I love that question. It's I agree. It's often by accident, often by serendipity, and maybe a little bit of planning for those for those of us that are that are diligent. But I actually, uh, it wasn't written in the cards that I would be in this business. I, when I went into undergrad, I went to University of California at Santa Barbara. I wanted to be a marine biologist. Actually, I had nothing. I was nowhere near this industry. Um, wow. Lover of oceans, and ended up doing that. And and so, but when I was there, I started really finding finance and investments and. And this was in the early 90s. So I made the move up to the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. I went to Santa Clara University, where all there was a hotbed of obviously of all that was going on with the internet boom. And uh, in my time there, I worked at a large old school brokerage company. I worked at an RIA firm, early RIA firm, small one near the Apple headquarters. I worked for a large fund company. And when I came out, of, I was a research assistant for the finance department. So I really dove in at that point. And then when I came out of school, my first job was actually as a as a secondary markets uh, analyst at a, at a mortgage bank. I was at a lender, but my job was to set rates. And this was, I get a chuckle out of it now, is to forecast interest rates effectively. And I, di I didn't know why I wasn't very good at it as a young professional coming out. And then once I got to Dimensional, I figured out why I wasn't very good at forecasting the future. Maybe it's because the future is unknowable. <laughs> uh, but I, I, yeah, I got I got to Dimensional. I remember I moved, it was March of 98. I, I wanted to get back to Los Angeles where I'm from. So I moved back on a Wednesday. I had a temp placement agency had me interview for this very lowly role uh, on a Friday, and I started work on Monday. I just remember going in for the interview, and it was in Santa Monica, and I went up to the 11th floor, and I turned left, and I saw the Pacific Ocean, and I said, I don't care what they pay me or what the offer is, I'll take it. <laughs> I didn't know what we did, had no idea. Remember, this is 98. We were a firm of 60 to 70 people, probably, about 19 billion in assets under management. But it wasn't- and What do you have now? So it was 19 billion back then. What do you have now? Uh, we're just shy of about 800 billion, but 780 something somewhere. Unbelievable. In there. Yeah. And I think I know that building, by the way. I think I, I used to call on like there was a broker dealer there or something. There was a Merrill Lynch here. A Wilshire Associates has been in this office for quite some time as well. So we've had some folks uh, in our industry uh, come through here and stay here in this building. Yeah. But it wasn't, I mean, honestly, I really didn't know what we did. And so when I got here, my first job was to draft RFPs for institutional prospects, which was actually a great job at that time because there were no databases. You were writing, you were like actually old school writing. And so it was a great way for a young person to actually learn what we did as an organization. But then for those of you that know Dimensional, we're, we're basically an extension of academia. So at the same time, I was reading, pouring through academic white papers. This was five years after the foundational work by Jean Fama and Ken French uh, in 1993, their paper called The Cross-Section of Expected Stock Returns. And so those, it was a really vibrant time to be in an organization that was super connected to academia. And so there was just all these synapses that were firing for me. All the light bulbs were going off. And I started recognizing, God, how cool is it when you can pair, you can pair up this robust academic work with real life investment needs of families out there. And, and so... I started working with our advisors in 1999, so a year after I started, and I've been working with financial advisors and wealth managers ever since. And um, I ran our Latin America business. I worked with advisors in the U.S. for a lot of my time here. I ran our U.S. advice business, and now, as you said, I, I kind of help to oversee our global uh, global client group. 
You know, that is fascinating. I got to just go back to the marine biologist. Um, that is definitely a first. I've had oh, all kinds of um, what people wanted to do. A lot of writers, a lot of psychiatrists, uh, people that that's what they thought they were going to go into. A lot of English majors, but I love the marine biologist angle. And it was funny because we were on a call yesterday on a completely unrelated topic to this. And we were talking about Greg Friedman's work uh, in the Marine Mammal Center. And now I know why you know that. <laughs> um, there's a there's an interesting connection there, but uh, that's really fascinating. Do you still tie back at all to the marine biology? You still love the ocean? Obviously, you you chose a firm that uh, that is located close to it. But is that still a little bit of a passion for you uh, prof uh, personally? It is. I'm I'm an avid ocean advocate, uh, both recreationally, surfing, paddling, outrigger canoeing, whatever I can be on the ocean. I I do as much as I can. This this work thing gets in the way of that a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but I also, my wife and I helped to start, we're founding members of a, a marine ecosystem conservation organization, a philanthropy organization, where we protect marine ecosystems in and around surf, these pristine surf breaks around the world. So we've got a bunch of legally enforceable protected areas now around the world, Indonesia, South America, and some others. So very passionate about that as well. Well, that could be a whole other podcast. Maybe that's a whole other idea. That's fantastic. And congratulations. And thank you for your efforts around that. That's such an important, that's such an important area for us all to be mindful of. So thank you for that. And you know, you mentioned uh, something that's going to kind of tie back into my next question, right? So in all my years in this industry, which are a lot, um, rarely have I seen DFA spend a lot of money on marketing itself, right? Which is really the opposite of what used to happen in the asset management business, right? They were the largest advertisers, the largest conference goers, all of that. Yet you guys have such a strong following with so many of the top advisors in the profession. So why, from your perspective, do so many of the firms choose to work with DFA? And you mentioned something that I wonder if it has something to do with this. I never kind of heard that explanation that you're an extension of academia, which I think is really, really smart and interesting way to connect that. But is that is that one of the reasons? And then what are some other reasons? Why has DFA been so successful without essentially really putting marketing dollars behind your brand? Well, I love the question. And I'll first say we feel an incredible amount of gratitude for advisors that have chosen to trust us over the years. It's it's amazing. And I'll go back, especially in the early years when we started, we've been working with advisors in a dedicated way for 35 years. Now, you, you made an interesting point, which I which is absolutely right. We started in a different place of the advisor ecosystem than most asset management companies start. We started working with people that had no money because they just broke away from the big houses to go independent. That's what we, that's where we started 35 years ago. And so in a sense, we grew up together with this community of independent advisors that broke away and they wanted something different for themselves and for their clients. And I think we were, it was a bit of serendipity. I mentioned that word before, right place, right time, and the right answer for these people. So we grew up together kind of stumbling through this, this idea that we want to change what is inherently a sales business to an advice business, a one that is centered on the client, doing the best we can for the client. It's their money. We all work for them. It should not be the other way around. And so we felt very strongly about that. Um, and there was advisors that, that felt that message and gravitated to that message in that period of time. So we never thought of what we were doing as sales and marketing is the answer to your question. It, it, it never occurred to us that that's what this was. This was, in, as, our, was executed on our objective, which is as an organization, we want to help more people lead more fulfilling lives all over the world. And this was the way we knew how to do that. We knew that something was broken. We knew that we could do better as an industry. We knew that we had the investment tools and solutions to match up with that vision of how to offer great advice and a client-centric experience. And we think that's actually what the best advisors wanted for themselves. They just didn't have the answer until someone came along and said, okay, let's, let's create more clarity around this vision and the things you've been feeling. And now let's actually show you that you can deliver on your objectives. One of the things we heard over and over again, and I still continue to hear 30 years later, is I didn't actually know I could do what I wanted to do for my clients in this business. And I, we we have these conferences, and I can't tell you how often I hear people walk away from the conference saying, gosh, I wish I would have learned this 20 years ago, 30 years ago. 
So I think this idea of a clear, consistent, defendable, research-backed investment approach coupled with these folks that were really all about client clients' best interest was important because so from the, there was some DNA being some connective tissue being built together there. Mm -hmm. Then I think the other thing that that helped us a lot is that we never compete with advisors. We don't have an advice business at Dimensional. So if we're going to impact people's lives, a necessary part of that mission is to execute good work with advisors because they're the ones that actually have the relationship with the client. So the ordering should be the client's on top, the advisor works for the client, we work for the advisor and the client. And so anything we can do to amplify the impact they have, to give them a, a better investment proposition, to arm them with better communication tools, to involve them in our studies, to to allow them better paths toward building thriving, sustainable, growing businesses. That is, that's what we've been doing for the entirety of our experience with advisors. So I guess it's, in some ways, you might say it's surprising that the leading firms work with us. And I'm, it's not that I'm not grateful for it, but in other ways, if I didn't know who Dimensional was and I, and I told you the story and how we support firms, I'd say, yeah, they, they probably have a really good relationship, even in partnership, small p, with these organizations. But maybe even simpler, Suzanne, is what we know about investors is that they want to work with advisors that know what they're about. Like they, they, the way they choose advisors is whether or not the advisor has experience working with clients like them. And I think that's why advisors choose to work with dimensionals. I think they know that over the course of 35 years, we've worked with all types of advisors, startups to large enterprise organizations. We can talk to the CEO of a of a national aggregator and offer wonderful support, understand where they're going, amplify their impact. And we can talk to a, a, a brand new person looking to do great work in their community here. Yeah, it sounds like between your research and academia background, you, obviously you have to have good returns or you, would, you wouldn't have had a following at all, right? Your approach is very different and you kind of grew alongside the RIA and the advisor business too, which has just exploded in the last 25 years. So um, I love that. I think that's really an interesting way to have refocused or have focused from the beginning. I think a lot of firms try and, try and execute on what you're talking about now, but they certainly didn't do that 25 years ago. So, um, well, thanks for explaining that. That's that's fascinating. And you- Well, can I, can I make one comment? You made it actually, I think a really critical observation is that uh, we have to deliver on our promises as well. This this can't be a, a marketing pitch. It's It's gone on for 35 years. So it couldn't be the case that we say we advocate for advisors and here's all these robust investment solutions that you and your clients can rely on so that you can do a discovery process, you can design a financial plan, you can deliver with these tools and you can keep them disciplined, what I call the four Ds. If we don't, like that would have failed a long time ago if we actually weren't delivering on our promises. So you know, one of the ways to look at that is, and you talked about, you know, performance and returns. And yes, th those are the catalyst to have people having a good financial experience. It's what funds consumption and sending kids to good universities and giving to philanthropy and paying for healthcare in aging years. So returns are important. And one of the ways that we think about that is, like we've done a bunch of studies on this, and one of them is a survivorship and performance study. So for example, if you look 20 years ago, and you said, let's take a look at all the funds in the industry 20 years ago. How many of those funds survived? Are still? I didn't talk about performance, that they're still here. And it's less than 50%. Really? In the US, less than 50% still live on that were, that were live 20 years ago. And how many do you think, what percentage of them actually outperform their benchmark, which is which is their mandate? It's their remit. These are, this is, I'm not talking about index funds. We'll talk about them in a second. This is their mandate. Uh, less than 20%. I think it's 17% is the number. So is that different from dimensional? And, and the answer is absolutely. 100% of our funds that existed 20 years ago still exist. Wow. And about 80% of them have, have outperformed their benchmark. That is, it's basically a reciprocal of what you see in the industry. So that's, if you're an advisor, you want to know that you can rely on your, your partners, your fund managers, not just to live on, but, but to actually deliver on what they say they're going to deliver. And so that adds a bit of confidence, clarity, conviction, so that when advisors are out there talking to prospects and clients, they know that they're not just blowing hot air. They actually have confidence that they're delivering on the promises they make. 
Yeah, that's a pretty uh, specific statistic, and um, that thanks for sharing that. I had no idea that 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 can be a good data point when we're uh, when we're promoting this podcast. And you you mentioned some studies that you do, and I know you've been producing an investor focused study for many years. It's very respected. So drawing on those insights, plus your background in working with thousands of advisors over the years, what do you feel advisors need to do to set them up to best serve the client of the future, right? There's new demands, there's new attitudes, there's new ways that clients are thinking about retirement. So what what are the highlights from that investor study that you think important to, to point out to the advisors listening? I love this question, Suzanne. I think it's a really important one that advisors ought to be asking themselves to, to make sure they're set up for success in the future. Now, I, I have a particular perspective, which I don't think that human beings will fundamentally change. Uh, I think advice will necessarily have to evolve. So, but what do I mean by that? Mm-hmm. I think that a client's decision to choose advisors has always been and will always be an emotional one. So, and by that, I mean, effectively, we can have lots of conversations when we interview advisors and we can talk about, you know, trusts and estate planning and asset allocation, rebalancing and all the things. But in the end, I think clients really want some answers to some very simple questions. Like, if I choose this advisor, will I be okay? Do I trust this advisor to have my best interest at heart? Does this advisor in front of me under, really understand me? And do they have experience working with people like me? Now, the ways that we get clients to answer those questions for themselves may be different depending on the client segment we're talking about. And as you said, as services evolve, I absolutely agree with you that it's already happened. You know, 20 years ago, we had investment advisors and now we have wealth managers, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's been a, a, a massive influx of bolted on services that I think are very healthy for the industry, I think are great for the investor. I think that's going to continue. So it, what I'm not saying is that all clients will process an advisor's value proposition the same. Not all clients will want the same thing from advisors. But I do think that what's what's really important is that advisors understand who their target audience is and set their firms up, surround that target client profile with the right kind of services that that those people will respond to. So another data point, you mentioned our study, and one of them that I uh, that I appreciate is, is pairing the investor study with our advisor study. So we ask a question in our advisor study, and that, that's one that we've been doing for a long time. And we get about 500 to 1,000 firms every year that responding to this study. It's the biggest global study of its kind. One of the questions we ask, uh, well, actually, I'll back up. We can slice and dice this, this stuff all so many different ways. One of the main questions we get is, is how are advisors growing? What's how? What are successful firms doing? And uh-huh. so I remember running a, an experiment a couple of years ago, looking at high growth firms versus low growth firms in our study, trying to pull out what are the insights we can draw? What, what are they doing differently? And one data point I looked at was target client profile. Back to this point, like I, I, I would imagine that the high growth firms are just better at getting really clear on who they're who they serve. And it turns out about 80 percent of those high growth firms have a target client profile. I saw great. And what I expected to see when I when I go to low growth firms is probably a lower percent have a target client profile. I was wrong. Actually, about 80 percent of the low growth firms also had a target client profile. So I thought, shoot, OK, I missed that hypothesis. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. So they both both had like kind of niche niche client bases. But what was so I'm, I'm so curious what the differentiator is now. Ah, you're getting there. The difference is, is what that what that description is. So for the low growth firms, their target market was based on age and assets. Very common. For the high growth firms, it was age and assets, but it was also values, professions, hobbies, behaviors. So now go back to something I've already said in our discussion here, which is from our investor study, we learned that investors primarily choose advisors because they have experience working with people like me. So if I'm interviewing two advisors, and one says, advisor A says, yeah, Bryce, it's be great to work with you. We got people your age with the same amount of money that you have. And another one says, oh, Bryce, yeah, it's great. And we, yes, age and money, that's that's great. But we understand your philanthropic desires. We understand your passions, your goals, what you want to do. We work with people in financial services. Like they, They're they going to have a much more resonant description of who I am as an individual. And those questions that I asked, will I be okay? 
Will this person be operate in my best interest? They have experience working with clients like me. That advisor is going to win 10 out of 10 times because they're very clear on that target client profile. Yeah, um, that uh, that's really great information. And a couple of comments around that. I had uh, a financial advisor on not too long ago, Stacey Francis, and she's an RIA in New York, and she's experiencing significant organic growth. So not through m a but organically. And one of the reasons is she's got a technical specialty where she's a certified divorced analyst. I forget what the acronym is, but she she works with divorced women. So she's got a target segment of widows and divorced women. And she's got a technical specialty where she is called upon to be an expert witness in divorce cases. And so that, you know, marrying those types of like technical specialty, niche client base, et cetera, really has, um, you know, skyrocketed her, skyrocketed her firm. It also makes it much easier to market when you talk when I talk to advisors about how they're marketing themselves to get more clients if you're just doing it on agent assets that's like you know there's a there's there's so many prospects out there it's almost like if you can narrow down that focus you can narrow down that message and narrow down where you would market um the distribution partners through so um that's fascinating i love that you just um that you just focused on that. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, um, one, one other one other add on to that I would say is because you might have some large firms listening to this podcast and and to, admittedly, it's very diff difficult for an organization once you get to a certain size to have a, a target niche. It doesn't mean, however, that advisors in their local communities, so if I've, I might I might be the CEO of a national wealth management organization, I've got 40 offices around the country. It does not mean that those advisors operating in their local communities cannot be the expert in their community and their target market. So while at the organizational level, it's very hard to say we, we service this small subset, this, this tiny demographic. It's at some point you don't have an organizational niche. But as a network of professionals and advisors within an organization, you might be able to execute on that mission pretty well. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so, you know, really, you you brought you um, brought up the um, marrying kind of that investor data with advisor data. How do advisors get access to your to your um, to those insights, or do they need to be a DFA client, or how does that work? Yes, they do need to be a dimensional client. Um, Thankfully, we have lots of advisors that do work with us, but it's, these studies are packaged inside what we call Dimensional 360. Dimensional 360 is a, it's a moniker, it's a brand that we use to signal that we really are trying to surround advisors with support and services that will help amplify their impact out in the world. So we have three legs of that stool. One is investments, and we can talk about, we're, at, the, at, the, at the end of it, we're, we're nerdy capital markets people, we're academics at heart, we love this stuff. Uh, and we're really passionate that there are higher probability ways of giving people great investment experiences and that we think we're on that path. Um, we're very, very committed to continuing to evolve, improve, and have the best answers on the investment side for people. And that's oftentimes, it, theoretically, that should be enough, but we know it's not because you need to communicate this stuff as well. So it's investments, then communications. Communications is another leg of that stool. We want advisors to understand what we do. Uh, so that they can make educated decisions about how to integrate it into their business. We want them to talk to each other in the business. So internally at the firm, how do you communicate this stuff to, to a, a, a broad audience if you have a large firm in a way that they'll respond to it? And then how do you take what are, can sometimes be inherently complex ideas and distill them into bite-sized nuggets for clients and prospects of advisors? And we spent a lot of time on communications. Uh, and the last one, so it's investments, communications, and then business strategy. Business strategy is where we have our global advisor study, our global investor study. We have dimensional communities, which are effectively study groups. And we have, you know, a hundred of these things running out there. We have executive forums, specialty councils, peer-to-peer -peer interactions. So those all sit under the business strategy umbrella. And all of that is available to advisors that that work with Dimensional. Obviously, when I say work with Dimensional, we're not a consulting company. We we have one revenue source and it's the management fee on our investment solutions. They, they obviously have to be users of our investment solutions to tap into all of these resources. Yeah. So you really focused on um, the, the main difference between high growth and low growth firms from, the, um, from what's setting those apart 
as being a, a, a much more defined target client base. What was like the second, you know, I would say differentiator? Yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't even say that was the main one. There were several things that fell out of this experiment trying to trying to understand and uncover what the differences are. That was certainly one. I would say another one was culture, a culture of growth, not in a bad way. And sometimes I think our industry is hung up that sales is, a, is somehow a, a dirty word. And it's it's not. I mean, if if advisors really do want to help more people in their community, sales, growth, whatever we want to call it, business development, uh, that is part of it. And so the most successful, the, the high growth firms had this commitment to business development. It didn't, it didn't hide it in the back corner somewhere. It was ex that growth mandate was explicit and they set up systems, workflows, infrastructures to align with that growth objective. I'll give you a couple of examples. I remember it was probably two years ago in our study, we asked firms, what did you expect you of your organic growth, not market growth, not in organic mm -hmm. growth, organic growth in the next 12 months? And just looking at that, the differences were amazing. It was, it was amazing. I love this data. The, the low growth firms said 6% is what we expect organic growth. The high growth firms is about double. So even from an, an, just pure intentionality, they didn't do anything yet. Just in pure intention and sense of purpose around growth, uh, the high growth firms said, we're going to have to do things a little bit differently. And so there's there's a very clear difference in the way that they identify their value proposition that uh, as a percentage of all employees, it's more often the case that all employees at or mostly employees at high growth firms can articulate the value proposition more than the low growth firms. Um, there is a more there's more intention around measuring pipelines, following up on pipelines, sourcing new business activities. So there's just if, if you have that that kind of an expectation, uh -huh. you know, an aspirational expectation on organic growth, you got to do things differently. It doesn't happen by accident. Yeah, those are great points. And you would, it's kind of shocking to think that um, a firm wouldn't have those things in place. But uh, I was on a panel not too long ago with Michael Kitsis, and he he made a really interesting comparison, like, you know, looking at the prof other professional service other professional service industries, such as doctors. The doctor is there to treat the patient and their symptoms and come up with a solution, right? Um, to help, you know, uh, get, you know, make them better or whatever, whatever it would be. They're not expected to go out and find patients. So it's very similar in the financial advice space where, um, you know, how a lot of the advisors that have come into this industry to, to serve clients and to offer them investment solutions and retirement solutions, et cetera, they, they don't know how to market. They don't know how to sell. That's not their skill set. And so it sounds to me that the firms that are the higher growth focused firms are knowing that that's maybe not their specific skill set. They're hiring people to bring into their firms to concentrate specifically on that. It's, a, it's an interesting point. I, I don't think the final chapter has been written on this issue. I actually love that you brought this up. Uh, you're probably aware that there's been a high dispersion in growth rates in the wealth ecosystem. What do I mean by that? Not everyone's winning organically. Mm -hmm. Actually, in the RAA space, it's pretty dismal. Organic yes. growth in the last couple of years has been abysmal. Um, the vast majority of firms have zero to negative growth. The median is, is, is a horrific number. Um, there's some firms that are, um, if you look at the averages that are driving that they're doing amazingly well with organic growth. So, but people are still accumulating. Where are they going? Well, the big firms out there, the large wealth firms, the private banks, they're growing pretty darn well. Uh, they're, they're still doing great business out there. They're growing well. And the challenge I think for, uh, for the conventional independent community is that the, um, everyone kind of sounds the same, I guess is what I'm trying to say now in the wealth ecosystem, Nobody's marketing high commission, turn and burn, uh, you know, type of advice. No one's winning that business if they are. Everywhere in the wealth ecosystem is now taking a look at what the independent community has done and said, okay, that's actually where we have to go. So good news. I love this, that the independent, the culture of the independent advice community has now permeated itself everywhere. It's mm -hmm. fee-based, client-centric on the whole. There's wonderful advisors in every part of the wealth ecosystem at bank trust companies, at wirehouses, private banks, small RA firms, big RA firms, they're everywhere. And they're talking about advice in a very similar way. 
but it might mean that growth is a little bit harder because that competitive advantage that that the independents had, which was fee-based, client-centric, independent, is I'm not sure that's a differentiator as much anymore. At least the clients don't hear it as a differentiator. Yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, we well, we could go on and on and on just about the difference between high growth and low growth. And um, that's just a fascinating topic. I'm always interested to see what, what the various benchmarking studies show. Um, another topic that I love, and it's been up for debate lately, is whether a smaller firm with only a few advisors and team members can really compete effectively with firms that are focused through going, growing through M&A and really creating these massive entities out there. Um, what are your thoughts around this? What are you seeing from your vantage point? Are the days of the solo advisor coming to an end? Well, let me start before I give you my answer. This is this is my, this is my drum roll here. Before I start, <laughs> let me just say, we work with the some of the most successful national RA firms out there and and non RA firms, private banks and big firms that are doing wonderful work um, and that are that are growing orga inorganically, doing lots of acquisitions and they're terrific firms and they're growing they're growing well inorganically and organically. So, but I will say that I haven't seen a lot of evidence that somehow large acquirers are systematically growing organically at the expense of smaller firms. I okay. think it may be more likely that those large firms are increasingly competing for business with the other large firms, right? The old, the legacy private banks and maybe the likes of, um, you know, the, the newer types of wirehouses, like maybe they're now competing with the vanguards of the world who are, who have massive wealth management businesses and the Schwabs of the world have massive wealth management businesses, fidelities, in addition to the legacy large organizations. So, I don't, again, I don't, when I talk to advisors out there, I'm not seeing a lot of evidence that the big firm, big independent firm in a local community is somehow taking from small firm in local community. Um, I, it, it seems like these firms are now competing more with the branch offices of bigger companies in their own local community. I yeah. think there will always be a place for the small firm in this business. I think, go back to the comment, the discussion we had earlier, which is the decision to work with an advisor is very personal. It's very emotional. And I don't know that scalable systems and great technology and all these things that large firms may have that a smaller firm may not have as much of is what's going to win uh, for in every case. I think I have no issue that there will be thousands of advisors in local communities working with 50, 100, 200 people, and they'll have wonderful businesses. Remember, success is not defined the same way for every firm. To me, a successful firm is one where the owner, the passionate owner says, here's the kind of firm I want to have. And then the decisions they make are in alignment with that purpose. If someone says, I want to serve 50 families <clears throat> and hang up my cleats and just do that really well, and not take any more new clients, who's to say that's not a great firm? That's a fantastic firm. Uh, and, and they can do that now. It, the costs, I often hear this, uh, this refrain that costs are, are so high for small firms. I'm not sure I agree with that as well. I mean, costs seem to be coming down in pretty much every part of the wealth ecosystem, as far as I can tell, including all the fintech innovations mm -hmm. that are coming. So I think it's actually going to get easier to be a small firm, not harder. Now, if you want to have a succession plan and you want to succeed your firm and you want to build and grow a bigger firm, and be part of something bigger, by all means, uh, I think inorganic opportunities are can be an, an incredibly powerful catalyst. So I am not saying that uh, there's no use case at, at all. I do think though, when firms are really focused on inorganic, there's a potential to underestimate the amount of resources that are required to do that well. And we also see in our data that on average, the organic growth rate suffers at the expense of inorganic growth rate because of all the, of all the effort that's going into that. There's probably a bunch of reasons why that's the outcome. Yeah, I, I hope that the, the solo advisor, there's always a place, especially if we as an industry um, really want to serve a lot of the clients that aren't being served now. Um, there needs to be a place for all different types of models, fee structures, et cetera. So I agree with you. I, I'm, I'm hoping that, um, that we continue to grow and be able to serve more investors in need of great advice. And I think small firms are a great place to do that. Um, so we are, this has been fascinating. You've got, given me a lot of great data points. I think our listeners will be fascinated. So now our final question with the title and the theme of the podcast focused on the future in mind, 
What is your last line? What key takeaway do you want to leave our audience with? I think we touched on it already, which is this, this idea that good advice has won, that it's been wonderful to see that investors are generally better off today than they were a while ago. What that means, however, is that advice has converged and old competitive advantages may not serve you in the future. So I think it's really important for advisors and listeners to look for marginal advantages every place they can. That might be bolting on services that you didn't have, even marginally better than you have today. Uh, not starting a whole new division or doing an acquisition, but getting better, incrementally better every single day to start distancing yourself from the competition is very important. Picking up nickels, nickels and dimes and giving them back to clients wherever you can. I mean, this is this is a really important one for us um, because there's fee compression everywhere in the business, in the ecosystem. And we haven't necessarily seen fees come down from advisors, but we've seen service creep, right? Service expansion uh, for the same level of fees. And I think we'll probably continue to see that, quite honestly. What we don't want to do is leave money on the table that, it, that clients deserve. So what we, we want every decision to be in the best interest of clients, not because of a marketing reason, not because of an, that it's easy to explain. I see lots of advisors doing things because they don't want to have a tough conversation. They want to hit the easy button. So for example, uh, you know, buying the cheapest index fund because it's easy. I don't have to explain it. Buying the cheap index fund might be one of the most expensive decisions you actually make for an investor. The job isn't for your life to be easy. The job is to give the best experience possible to the investor. And so that might mean doing a little bit more exploration, for example, on the investment side and having a more systematic uh, you know, approach that can outperform benchmarks through time, that could do better than conventional active managers through time. And give that back to your clients as a value add and make sure they understand that you're fighting for them, every part of the ecosystem of your wealth management process. Yeah, I love that. So do more for your clients. That's a, a really great kind of theme that I hear throughout this podcast. And that was a great way to conclude this really fascinating interview. So thank you so much for being my guest today and for sharing such great insights on many things, especially around what firms and advisors need to do to best serve the client of the future. I'm Suzanne Syracuse. Thanks for listening. And I hope this episode leaves you feeling even more excited to be focused on the future. Thank you.